Landscape quilting, it's my favorite quilting pastime. From emails and comments, I know that many of you feel the same way. Natalie Sewell has been my quilting mentor and buddy for many years. We presented four mini series on this topic. Yet, Natalie, this time we're going to take a practical approach. Right, Nancy. In the past, we've shown you how to create complete scenes, but this time we're going to show you how to create the elements that make up a scene. The trees, the flowers, shadows, ground cover. Let's start with trees, often the most important part of a landscape scene. My design, October Evening, features a stand of birch trees on Washington Island, which is one of my favorite inspiration spots. We'll show you how to cut, shade, paint, and stipple them, which hopefully will give you the confidence to make some birch trees of your own. Landscape Quilting Workshop, that's what's coming up next on Sewing with Nancy. Sewing with Nancy, TV's longest airing sewing and quilting program with Nancy Zeman is made possible by Baby Lock, a complete line of sewing, quilting, and embroidery machines and sergers. Baby Lock, for the love of sewing. Madeira, specializing in embroidery, quilting, and special effect threads, because creativity is never black and white. Koala Studios, fine sewing furniture custom built in America. Clover, makers of sewing, knitting, quilting, and embroidery products for over 25 years. Experience the Clover difference. And amazing designs and Class A needles. During this series on landscape quilting workshop, Natalie and I are not going to show you, as we mentioned, how to compose the entire scene, but elements within the scene. And Natalie, we're going to start with October evening, as we mentioned, and start with the white birch. Right. I thought we'd start with just this. It seems so much easier for newcomers to landscape quilting, and even for people who have made them before, mm -hmm. to be able to focus on one element. So. We're going to try to recreate this exact scene. And if we show you step by step how we, I got to this point in this quilt, uh, perhaps you'll be able to recreate that yourself. We made a little mini mm -hmm. version here for you so, we, so that you can see exactly what we're doing. The background I've chosen for this piece is a very dark green hand dye. I like hand dyes and batiks because they have an irregular finish that makes it look, makes the scene look very natural. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to cut a piece of what I, th what, what I think will work well as a birch tree. And by cutting, I'm, you could make a birch tree, of course, with a, with a ruler, but you would lose so much of its natural uh, character. character. And trees, you know, have good years and bad years, and therefore they don't <laughs> grow straight. So. That's what we're, I'm showing you exactly how I tend to cut trees. Now the decision is, do I want to use the front or the back of this tree? And I think in this case, I'm going to use the front of the tree because one of the things mm -hmm. we love about birch trees is how white they are. And lately I've been fooling around with watercolors. And this is a white watercolor. I've mixed a little bit of water and a little bit of paint in a brush and I'm going to just paint this birch tree and make some actually really snow white spots on it before I do the normal shading. Kind of through the middle area. The sides I'm going to save to darken but this snow white really makes a birch come alive. And, you, and I'm not a painter but I can, I can, you can do this. You can see that right. this is not um, rocket science. Mm -hmm. Anybody can dip a brush into some water and paint and make a birch tree. Nice. And then we're going to add, I think the first thing we're going to do is add some leaves. And here I've picked something that I think is the correct scale for birch leaves. It's a green model fabric with beautiful mm -hmm. with roundish leaves birch leaves are very round and I'm going to show you how I cut leaves I'm not going to follow every little detail of the leaf itself because we don't need that kind of accuracy it's better when they're a little messy 
And I'm going to set these on here. I don't care if I reproduce it exactly. No two leaf branches are the same. And what you might do is flip it to the other side. That's right. And in this case, I think I will. Now, the paint is mm -hmm. still a little wet, and we don't care. So here we have the traditionally the wrong side of the fabric, and we would glue these down with a glue stick, paper glue stick. It would dry. Yeah, I'll borrow that. Sure. Starting to take some shape. And then... And I'm putting the leaves on now, so that leaves me less of the birch tree to have to shade. Sure. Speaking of shading, you're going to then shade the sides with a permanent marker. And I'm going to decide, well, the light is coming from over on this side. Just a decision to make and be consistent throughout your whole piece. And then I'm just going to shade one side. I'm using a bold black permanent marker. When you're using markers, make sure they say permanent because you, your quilt mm -hmm. will undergo some steaming and some ironing and you don't want bleeding. And then you'd also add, after the white paint dries, some little markings within the middle. And I think I can do that, actually, because you do want, this isn't, my markers sort of. <laughs> they dry and, out after a while, they right? They do dry out. And here is a little bit of silver mm -hmm. that sort of it's magic. works to blend the two. And now. I'm going to color the leaves a little bit because I have a touch of fall in this scene. And the leaves sort of come alive when they're dotted with nice. a little color. Well, Natalie is finishing that. Once you've mastered the art of cutting and shading, highlighting a light color tree, you can easily apply the same skills to ma mastering dark trees. View of Home is a scene that I created, has many components, but let's just zero in on the foreground trees. It reveals shading and highlighting using much, many of these same techniques. Underneath here we have View at Home, and as we unveil it, you just saw a close-up of it. The sh trees in this area are created much in the same way. Instead of working with dark fabric, light fabrics, we're starting with dark fabrics. And using the same shading techniques, instead of using acrylic paint in the middle, white, simply used some yellow in the middle. So it's same technique, different fabric. And those are the basics of working with light and dark trees. Creating a close-up of a tree leads to the next level of landscape quilting techniques. When Natalie taught me the art of combining fabrics and highlighting with oil pastels, it was an exciting revelation. My design, Branching Out, showcases creating texture and sunlight with fabric and shading techniques. Again, we're working with small little pieces, about five by seven, six by eight, and we have lots of fabrics to show you for shading trees with fabric. Now, Natalie, we have three shades of fabric. Right, and this time you've picked a, a bark fabric, Nancy, that has looks as if it's dappled with sunlight already, mm -hmm. which is really very nice, but we wanna show where the light is coming from in the scene, which adds drama. So instead of using a yellow pastel, which you usually do, we're gonna cut tiny strips of this fabric and make it as if the sun were shining on that side of the tree. Mm -hmm. it, it's a very good technique for creating, for shading, instead of just drawing with markers. And then that means that the dark will be on this side of the tree. And if we look here... And I'm just gluing this down with a glue stick. It dries clear, use it all the time, works well. Just place it on. You can see it's starting to take some shape. Right. And now it's time to add branch and some leaves. The branch we made from the mid-size bark. And with branches, you have to kind of make sure they have a little curve as in nature. There you go. Your leaf fabric is perfect in terms of size and scale and the way the leaves twist, but I have to say it's a little dull. Yeah, yeah. We, we 
fussy cut these is you can see that they are following the shape of the leaf. We have two tec technical terms, fussy cut and messy cut, but they, they don't have a lot of light. And so to add light, the technique is to use an oil pastel or a fabric marker and give it a kiss of sunshine. And a little bit of, of orange and sort of a melon color here now and then mm -hmm. to just make it interesting. And obviously we're just quickly putting this together, but this shows you how the shading comes with the use of fabric. Now, Natalie, you've done the same on your quilt called the oak. Right. This quilt features a giant oak. The texture of the tree dominates the scene and was created by black and rust markers on the dark green fabric, followed by intense wavy quilting lines. The process was nerve wracking, but it I was helped along by my having large oak trees right outside my <laughs> studio window to inspire me. Distant trees are the feature of this next landscape quilting lesson. The Red Barn in Winter is my newest design and was inspired by Todd Classy's photo in the December 2009 issue of Wisconsin Trails magazine. The hand-drawn trees surrounding the barn are surprisingly easy to make with fabric markers, and we will show you how. When you take a look, close-up look at Natalie's great scene, of course, the barn is the feature, but without the surrounding areas, it would pale. So we're going to concentrate on this area because you may find a scene that requires distant trees. And I did use fabric in some of the foreground trees, but I carried it out by just drawing the others. And here's how I did it. First of all, our, our fabrics. We picked a, I picked a hand-dyed fabric that has lots of movement in it to depict a, a Wisconsin winter sky. Mm -hmm. And then this I bought years ago. I thought it would make waving, <laughs> roll, waving ocean scene and discovered that if you look very carefully and landscape quilters know how to look at their fabric very carefully, you see rough snow mm -hmm. splotches. And that's what I used. I messy cut them. And messy cutting is simply the act of making a mess while you cut. And this is how I do it primarily find a nice spot here. And your fabric gets equally as messy. Oh yeah, the fabric is always a mess, very hard to fold, but it's just a matter of chewing up the fabric. Mm -hmm. And if you're really precise, this is probably out of your comfort zone, but it really works well making yes. rough edges. It looks easy, it isn't as easy as students mm -hmm. will tell you. And then simply place it on there and it looks like it's part of the scene. And we've used a glue stick to temporarily position it on and now the magic comes with using fabric markers, permanent markers. One of the best ways that we dis I discovered accidentally mm -hmm. really is if you make a black line and then go along that same line with a silver pen, you have the sense of a tree with shadow and shade. So let me just start. And then by connecting that with a little bit of silver just alongside, just to highlight. hold that straight, mm -hmm. you do get the sense Certainly do. of a tree. And that's exactly how I've done this. And in kindergarten and in first grade, we drew very straight trees. Well, now trees are willowy and have lots of character, easy to draw, much better than a straight edge. This is a great deal of fun. <laughs> it's a little easier right side up than upside down. You're doing well, Natalie, for doing this upside down. And you too can practice this when the workbook that accompanies this program will give you the step-by-step -step instructions so that you can follow right along and make samples. It's best to give you some confidence first and then on a practice. And if you make a mistake, just turn it into a branch. Very nice. In a few minutes, we're going to show you how to work with these little samples and practice stippling, and as you can see, the little sample that we have here. Easy to work with on a smaller sample, just give it a practice, and you too can hand draw distant trees. Taking the landscape quilting workshop, one of your steps will be to work with stippling, to layer your quilt 
add a batting, a lightweight batting and a backing and do meandering stitches to attach the layers together, secure them, little light bulb pieces or puzzle end pieces. N Natalie and I will show you the details of working with this, but the first the quick setup. At your machine, you're going to set your machine for free motion quilting Attach a quilting foot, various sizes and shapes, clear monofilament thread for the needle, matching thread for the backing, and then you're going to lower the feed dogs. Drop them so that you're going to be driving the fabric. Now, Natalie, we normally choose, as this quilt shows, that we have a print fabric for the back, but we're not going to this time because in order for you to see process, we're going to layer the mini quilt, the batting, and a lightweight backing. We're also going to use black bobbin thread <laughs> so that you can see exactly what we're doing, but we would never do that normally. We would always match the bobbin right. thread to the fabric. It's humbling we... when you see my stitching. <laughs> <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> uh, so what we're going to do then is show you how to stipple each of these pieces and Here's the, the October evening scene, and with the tree, look at what it looks like from the back now that I've quilted it. I haven't stippled at all in the tree trunk itself, because hopefully when I'm through, the trees will protrude just that much so that it gives dimension to the quilt. I've noticed the messy area in here. That's where I followed the pattern of the leaves, and the areas that are smooth and more organized are the plain areas where I've stippled. Now, one of the tricks, and I'll show this to you too in a few in a second or two, is to try to make that stippling not lie in rows, but to move gracefully around the quilt. It doesn't really matter where you start, as long as you remember not to quilt in the trees and to stipple the bare areas. This is Nancy's quilt and you can see that she's used her trees as highways and that's why there's repeated lines through them um, and she has stippled the, the rest of it completely and made some allowances for the leaves where irregularities occur by stippling right around those leaves. So the pattern is very similar in all of these. Here's Nancy's uh, branching out and again no stippling in the tree trunk and lots of using highways around her branches to reach the various areas and she's stippled in the bare areas. Now I'm going to show you exactly how I stippled this piece. This is you can see in the back that I again even when the trees are tiny like this I have left them bare so they'll protrude and in fact they do a little bit and that mm -hmm. adds dimension. Everywhere else I've stippled, and I'll show you exactly how that goes. So you have the same machine set up as we talked about earlier, and you're ready to practice. That's right. And I'm going to go down one tree, and then instead of crossing the lines, I'm going to go down another tree. No one will ever know, and it doesn't matter. When you come to a piece of uh, fabric that's been glued on or sewed on, you might want to use something to hold it in place as you go. Now I'm going to stipple in the interior of this space and in order not to make lines I'm not I'm going to go in a crooked way. Instead of going straight across I'm going to go down and then up and then across and down and up and across. Use my tree as a highway and keep going. When I get to the snow I'm not going to stipple neatly, I'm going to make a mess because I want that to look more like snow. And again, little pieces stick up, you simply <laughs> hold them down with your needle cutter or whatever. Yes. Every once in a while you get a piece that won't mm -hmm. go down, just lift your feet, lift your needle up and put it down there. As Natalie finishes stippling, you'll notice that these small little samples are perfect ways for you to practice in your landscape quilting workshop.
Perhaps the question that most of you would like to ask me but are a little afraid to do so has nothing to do with fabric and thread. The topic, my face. Obviously, I'm not symmetrical. My eye and mouth on my right side have a partial paralysis called Bell's palsy. It happened when I was just a baby, about one year old. Being a public figure with a facial paralysis has prompted many of you to write to me and ask questions when a friend or perhaps a loved one is stricken with a comparable paralysis. To address your curiosity and also answer some of those questions, I've invited a special guest. I'd like you to meet Dr. Justin Satin. Dr. Justin Satin is a neurologist and medical director of the University of Wisconsin Health Comprehensive Stroke Program. Thank you for being my guest. Thanks for having me. I doubt when you graduated from medical school you thought you'd be in a sewing and quilting program. I never thought I would. And, and here you can add this to your resume. Thank you, I will. So we're here to address the facial paralysis because I, I get comments and people are wondering about this. And just as a summary, tell us the th areas that often cause facial paralysis. Well, the most important thing in the occurrence of abrupt onset of facial weakness mm -hmm. is to consider a stroke. So that's a medical emergency yes. and uh, folks should seek emergency medical attention for that mm -hmm. and not try to diagnose a Bell's palsy or, or anything sure. else themselves. And that's important because stroke has, um, has very specific treatments that are time sensitive, have to be given right away. Now, once that's been excluded, there are uh, several other conditions that can cause mm -hmm. uh, facial weakness. Some of them are a little bit concerning, like a brain tumor. Yes. And some are a little bit less concerning, like an inner ear infection, as is likely when it occurs in a, in right. a young child. That was uh, what caused onset of mine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lyme disease is a uh, known cause of facial weakness, and, and Wisconsin, of course, is an endemic area for, for Lyme disease. And then when other causes have been excluded, and we, mm -hmm. uh, and we don't know what the cause is, uh, then it's, it's called Bell's palsy, which is, is by definition uh, a facial nerve weakness of, of uncertain cause. And I happen to know it's the seventh cranial nerve. That's correct. It's the seventh cranial nerve. So the treatment, if someone would have an onset of facial paralysis, is as follows. Well, there is now evidence, unlike 50, 50 years, years ago, ago right, yes. that, that there are treatments that can affect the course of this illness. And the, the one for which there's the most evidence is steroids, like prednisone. Mm -hmm. And this is because Bell's palsy is probably caused by some inflammation of that seventh nerve. It, that inflammation may or may not be caused by a viral infection. That's still rather controversial. But irrespective of that, it appears mm -hmm. that giving steroids to reduce the inflammation in the nerve is beneficial for preventing a more serious long-term uh, paralysis. Now, in addition to the steroids, we mm -hmm. sometimes add some antiviral medication because there's a theory that, that Bell's palsy may be caused by uh, reactivation of a viral infection in the nerve. That's a little bit more controversial, but the steroids are pretty well accepted as a treatment. So if your physician perhaps would say, just go home and it will go away, get a second opinion. I would recommend that, mm -hmm. again, because there is some evidence that treating early with the steroids can really affect Absolutely. the course of the disease. Um, I wouldn't want to just sit on that. And also because there are other things that can mimic Bell's palsy, and it's important to exclude them. Yes. Now, there's a very positive recovery rate. Yeah, the, the prognosis mm -hmm. is excellent from Bell's palsy in most cases. About 70% of people make a full recovery or near full recovery. Sure. And about 15% of people make a partial recovery. And then about 15% are left with more severe mm -hmm. weakness. The folks who have uh, complete paralysis to begin with, unfortunately, are the ones who are more likely to have some residual weakness of the, of the face. The people whose facial weakness is only fairly mild to begin with have a very good prognosis, and over 90% of those folks make ah. a full recovery. Well, that's encouraging. It is. And it's encouraging that it's being treated with aggression rather than passivity, as it was many, many years ago. So there um, also brain tumor perhaps has 
be a cause of this? That's an important uh, consideration to mm -hmm. think about when the uh, face becomes weak because sure. uh, there is a tumor that you may have heard of called an acoustic yes. neuroma. Uh, the more technical term is a vestibular schwannoma. But these are tumors that involve the, um, uh, the lining, if you will, of the cranial nerves, usually the eighth cranial nerve, oh. so it would cause hearing loss and balance disturbance. Sure. But if such a tumor were to grow long enough, uh, large enough that it, that it uh, compresses the adjacent seventh cranial nerve, then it could cause uh, facial weakness, or less commonly, the tumor itself can arise uh, from that nerve. So that's an important consideration. Well, Dr. Satin, thank you so much for being with us, and thank you for joining us, and perhaps having some of your curiosity answered. If you'd like to go to sewingwithnancy.com, Nancy's Corner, you can find out more when you click under Dr. Satin's name. Thanks for joining me. Bye for now. Nancy's and Natalie's fully illustrated landscape quilting workshop workbook includes instructions for all the techniques featured in this three-part series. It's $19.99 plus shipping and handling. To order the book, call 800-336-8373 or visit our website at sewingwithnancy.com 2417. Order item number BK2417, Landscape Quilting Workshop, credit card orders only. To pay by check or money order, call the number on the screen for details. Visit Nancy's website at SewingWithNancy.com for more information on this program. Sewing with Nancy, TV's longest airing sewing and quilting program with Nancy Zeman has been brought to you by Baby Lock, Madeira Threads, Koala Studios, Clover, Amazing Designs, and Class A Needles. Closed captioning funding provided by Rowenta. Sewing with Nancy is a co-production of Nancy Zeman Productions and Wisconsin Public Television.